All right, let's jump right in. Cool. Today we're tackling pretty tough diagnosis. Yeah. Aortic dissection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As young doctors and nurses, yeah. you know, uh, you guys are really going to need to be ready for this one. For sure. Because this is a serious condition where, uh, where recognizing it quickly is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Um, and so we're going to focus on like the really practical stuff that, that you guys can use right, right away in your practice. Yeah. We're going to explore pain patterns, physical exam findings, yes. um, some key initial tests that you want to be thinking about. Definitely. So to kind of get us started, yeah. um, can, can you just give us a little overview of what aortic dissection is? So aortic dissection is a tear in the inner layer of the aorta. And what happens is it allows blood to flow between the layers of the aorta, and that can lead to a rupture or damage to other organs. Oh, wow. Okay, oh, so yeah. so this is... It's a big deal. This is a big deal. Yeah. This is a very, very serious problem. Yeah. And the mortality rate increases every hour. Oh, wow. That treatment is delayed. Okay, so like every every minute counts with this. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um. So let's start with, I guess, the the symptom that we're probably going to see the most often. Okay. And, and that's pain. Right. So, so when we're talking to a patient, what are we listening for? So the pain is usually very sudden and severe. Okay. And patients will describe it as sharp or tearing. Okay. And it can actually migrate along the path of the aorta. So you might have a patient that says, oh, it started in my chest and now it's in my back. Okay. So the pain can move around. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And, and so does that mean... Even if it's not constant pain, we should still be concerned. Exactly. Intermittent pain can still indicate dissection. Okay. And the other thing that we have to be aware of is that some patients, especially older patients, may not have any pain at all. Oh, wow. So they could be having this very serious condition and not even have the most common symptom. Exactly. Yeah. It makes it really tough. That's that's a little frightening. Yeah. Um. So, so what, what other signs should we be looking for in those cases where maybe they don't have that classic pain? So in those cases, we have to be on the lookout for what we call atypical presentations. And this could be things like syncope, okay. stroke-like symptoms, or even cardiac tamponade. Wow. Okay. So these are yeah. more subtle signs that something is wrong, right. but may not be that classic aortic dissection pain. Exactly. Okay. So we need to have like a really high index of suspicion. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So... You, you mentioned something called CP plus one and one plus CP earlier. Yeah. Can you explain what, what those are all about? Yeah. So I like to think about the aorta as like a highway with exits. Okay. So CP plus one means chest pain plus another symptom that happens because the blood flow is blocked at one of those exits. Okay. So for example, you might have a patient that has chest pain followed by a stroke or maybe paralysis. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And that could be a sign of aortic dissection. That's a really good way to think about it, like a highway with the exits being blocked off. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And what a one plus CP? So one plus CP is basically the same idea, but in reverse. Okay. So we're asking patients that come in with maybe a stroke or paralysis. Uh -huh. Did you have any torso pain before this happened? Okay. So it's a retrospective approach to try to connect the dots. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's move on to the physical exam. Okay. Um, what are some of the key things we should be looking for? So one thing that is super important is to ask about Marfan syndrome in younger patients with unexplained torso pain. Okay. And even if they don't know if they have Marfan syndrome, we want to look for those physical signs like arachnodactyly, yeah. pectus excavatum, lanky limbs. So those features alone could raise our suspicion. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and then listening with our stethoscope. Okay. We want to listen carefully for a new aortic regurgitation murmur. Okay. Because that has a high likelihood ratio for dissection. Okay. So a new murmur should definitely be a red flag for us. Definitely. Um, and then what about checking their pulse and blood pressure? What, what should we be looking for there? Yeah. So we want to feel for a pulse deficit, which basically means the pulse is weaker or absent in one limb. Okay. And the other thing is we don't want to be misled by a normal or even low blood pressure reading. Oh, wow. The low blood pressure doesn't rule it out. No, not at all. In fact, a wide pulse pressure, which means there's a big difference between the systolic and diastolic readings. Uh -huh. That's a particularly concerning sign because that often means that the patient is in a preterminal state. Oh, wow. And they need immediate surgery. Okay. So so there are a lot of subtleties here. For sure. That we need to be aware of. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's move on to initial tests. Okay. Um, what should we be looking for beyond, you know, the classic widened mediastinum on a chest x-ray? 
So we don't want to rely solely on that finding. Okay. Because a normal chest x-ray does not rule out dissection. Gotcha. So what we can do is compare current chest x-rays to old ones and look for any changes. And then there's some more subtle signs that we can look for on the chest x-ray. Okay. Like a loss of the aortic knob contour or what we call the calcium sign. The calcium sign, what is that? So on a chest x-ray, you'll see this white line of calcium within the aortic knob. Uh -huh. And what we do is we measure the distance from that line to the outer edge of the knob. Okay. And if that measurement is greater than five millimeters, it's considered a positive calcium sign. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's... Yeah, and if it's greater than a centimeter, then hmm. it's even more suspicious. I'm definitely going to have to remember that one. Yeah. Um, okay, what about blood tests? Can those help us diagnose dissection? So one thing that's important to remember is that a positive troponin level doesn't automatically mean that it's a heart attack. Okay. In fact, about 25% of type A dissections can have an elevated troponin. Oh, wow. Okay. So we have to keep that in mind. Interesting. Yeah. And then in terms of D-dimer testing, the guidelines don't actually recommend it for aortic dissection because it's not specific enough. Okay. So we shouldn't be relying on that. Right. Um, okay. And you had mentioned point of care ultrasound or POCUS earlier. Yes. How, how helpful is that in evaluating these patients? So POCUS can be really helpful. Okay. It can be a game changer because it allows us to visualize that intimal flap. Okay. So I like to think of it as like retinal detachment of the torso. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, you see that flap. Yeah. And you know, it's dissection. Yeah. So while the sensitivity may not be perfect, uh -huh. the specificity is very high. Oh, okay. So if we see that, we can be pretty confident. You can be very confident. Okay. And the other thing we can look for with POCUS is a pericardial effusion. Okay. Which could mean that the dissection is actually spreading backwards. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've covered a lot of ground here. We have. We've talked about pain patterns, atypical presentations, yep. physical exam findings, Correct. and some of those initial tests. Right. Now, what are the crucial steps in actually managing a patient that we think might have an aortic dissection? So the first and most important step is to consult a cardiovascular surgeon. Immediately. Immediately. And that goes for all suspected cases, even type B dissections. Okay. So even if we're not sure or if we think it might be a less severe type U, we still want to get them involved right away. Absolutely. Because even type B dissections can sometimes require surgery. I... So it's always better to be safe than sorry. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So we're calling the surgeon? Yep. What about the actual medical management? Like, what are we doing for the patient? So the goal of medical management is what we call anti-impulse therapy. Okay. And basically what we're trying to do is reduce the stress on the aorta by lowering the heart rate and blood pressure. Okay. So it's kind of like calming the storm inside the aorta. Got it. So it's a multi-pronged approach. Exactly. Okay. And we always start with pain control because pain itself can actually elevate the heart rate and blood pressure. Right. So we want to get that under control right away. Makes sense. And, and what are we using for pain control? So usually fentanyl is the best option. Okay. We give it in small repeated doses. Okay. So something that's easy to titrate and digest. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. All right. So first pain and then what? Then we focus on heart rate control. Okay. And we want to aim for a heart rate of around 60 beats per minute. Okay. And the preferred beta blocker is Esmolol. Okay. And, and why Esmolol? So Esmolol is a good choice because it specifically targets the heart. Okay. And it doesn't cause as much of a drop in blood pressure. Right, right. We don't want to cause a sudden drop in blood pressure. Exactly. Especially before we've gotten the heart rate under control. Right, because that could actually make the dissection worse. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so first pain, then heart rate. Yeah. What about blood pressure? How do we manage that? So finally, we address blood pressure control. Yeah. And our target systolic blood pressure is around 110. Okay. And the medications that we prefer are nicardipine or clavidipine. Okay. And, and why those? So these medications are preferred because they act directly on the arteries. Okay. So those are our go-to choices. Exactly. What if we don't have those readily available? So if those aren't available, then we can consider labetalol or nitroprusside. Okay. But those medications can be a little bit more challenging to manage. Yeah. And they might cause a reflex increase in heart rate, which we don't want. Right. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. This is incredibly helpful. Good. Um, are there any other potential pitfalls that we should be aware of when we're managing these patients? Yeah. So... One thing to watch out for is what we call pseudo-hypotension. Okay. And this is where the blood pressure reading might be artificially low. Okay. Because the dissection is affecting the blood flow to 
the arm where you're taking the yep. blood pressure. Oh, wow. So it's not even an accurate reading. Right. Got it. So if you see a significant difference in blood pressure between the two arms, you always want to go with the higher reading. Okay. That's an important detail. Yeah. It could easily be missed. It could. Okay. Yeah. So we've got the surgeon on board. Yeah. We've got our three-pronged approach for the medical management. Mm -hmm. Anything else we should keep in mind? I think the main thing is just remember that aortic dissection requires vigilance, right. prompt action, mm -hmm. and very careful management. And you always want to consider it as a possibility, even in patients that don't have the classic symptoms. Okay. Yeah. Great advice. All right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the different types of aortic dissection. Okay. Um, you know, we've got type A and type B. Right. And it's really important to understand the difference between the two. Yeah. I, I know that they're classified based on where the tear occurs. Right. But I sometimes get it mixed up. Yeah, it can be confusing. So can you just like break it down for me one more time? Sure. So imagine the aorta like a candy cane. Okay. So type A dissections involve the ascending aorta, which is the part that's closest to the heart. Okay. So like the curved handle of the candy cane. So that initial part of the aorta. Exactly. Okay. What about type B? So type B dissections affect the descending aorta. Okay. And that's the long straight part of the candy cane. Got it. After the arch. Okay. Where the arteries branch off to the head and arms. That's a really helpful visual. I think I can remember that. Good. Um, so why is it so important to distinguish between the two? Well, the location of the tear really dictates how urgent the situation is and what treatment we're going to do. Okay. So type A dissections are generally more life-threatening. Okay. And they often require emergency surgery. And why is that? Why are type A dissections considered more dangerous? So the ascending aorta is closer to the heart. Okay. So a tear in that area can very quickly lead to complications like aortic rupture, oh, wow. severe valve problems, or cardiac tamponade. Those sound like very serious complications. They are very serious. Um, so if we suspect a type A dissection, is surgery always the answer? In most cases, yes. Okay. Because the risks of delaying surgery are just too high. Wow. So time is really of the essence with these type B dissections. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. What about type B dissections? Okay. Are those always managed medically? So type B dissections are often managed medically. Okay. Um, and the focus is on controlling blood pressure and heart rate. Okay. But there are some exceptions. Okay. So what are some situations where surgery might be necessary for a type B dissection? So we might consider surgery if the dissection is causing damage to vital organs. Okay. Or if the blood pressure can't be controlled. Okay. Or if the dissection is rapidly getting worse. Got it. So it really depends on the patient's specific situation. Okay. So even with type B dissections... Surgery is still a possibility. Right. Okay. Um, so let's talk about some scenarios that can make this whole thing more challenging. Sure. Um, wh what are some things that we should be particularly aware of? So one tricky scenario is when a patient presents with chest pain. Okay. And a positive troponin level. Okay. Because that can make it difficult to differentiate between aortic dissection and acute coronary syndrome or ACS. Right. Because I, I remember you saying that both of those conditions can cause those symptoms. Exactly. So how do we tell the difference? So we really need to consider the patient's history, right. the characteristics of their pain, uh -huh. and any other symptoms they might be having. Okay. So it's not enough to just look at one test result. Right. We have to look at the whole picture. Okay. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned atypical presentations earlier. Yes. Can you remind us why it's so important to recognize those? Sure. So aortic dissection can mimic a lot of other conditions, like yeah. a heart attack, a stroke. Uh, Even gastrointestinal problems. Wow. Okay, so it can really look like a lot of different things. It can. It's a master of disguise. So how do we avoid being fooled by these atypical presentations? So the key is to always have a high index of suspicion. Okay. And always consider aortic dissection, even if the patient doesn't have the classic symptoms. Okay, so even if it doesn't seem like the most obvious diagnosis. Right. We want to keep it in the back of our minds. What are some red flags that should make us think about it? So sudden syncope or fainting, okay. that can be a sign of aortic dissection. Okay. Stroke-like symptoms like weakness, numbness, difficulty speaking. Okay. I wouldn't have necessarily thought of those as being connected. Yeah. It's not always obvious. Okay. Um, and if the dissection affects the abdominal aorta, mm -hmm. it can actually cause pain that mimics conditions like pancreatitis or a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. Wow. So we really need to be thinking broadly. We do. And considering aortic dissection in a wide range of scenarios. Absolutely. Okay. And it's important to remember that atypical presentations are more common in certain groups, like 
older adults and women. Oh, really? Why is that? So older adults may have other conditions that kind of mask the typical symptoms. Okay, so it makes it harder to see what's really going on. Right, and women often experience different pain patterns. Okay. So it can be harder to recognize that classic presentation. So we need to be extra vigilant yes. in those populations. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. So to everyone listening out there, yeah. um, you are the front line of defense. That's right. Against this really challenging condition. Yeah. Um, but, you know, armed with knowledge. Yes. You guys can make a real difference. You can. So until next time. Until next time. Keep learning. Keep learning. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.